there, my YouTube gang. What's up? It's Johnnyversity. Again. Continuing our mission to explore strange new evolution theories and hypotheses. But first, the disclaimer. I'm waiting. So, last time I left you off after discussing the genetic aspects of modern evolutionary theories. And this time we'll explore the rest. And I'll do so in an increasing order of sophistication. First, mimetics. If you don't know what mimetics is, well, here's the basic definition. And here's an example. And if you want to know more about the basics of mimetics, there's a beautiful link in the description box for a video by Dan Dennett. But for the sake of argument, let's see how memes could influence evolution. So, religion is a meme. Islam is a religion. Some Muslims are encouraged by that meme to blow themselves up. Which is a great way to quickly rid the gene pool from suicidal individuals. Okay, but seriously, if you really want to know how this shit works, then check out this guy's channel, probably the most undersubscribed bloke in YouTube. Now, regarding behavior, it's really quite simple. We know that sometimes animals mimic their parents' activities. You know, stuff like hunting practices and bird singing. So, imagine that sometime in the past, a rodent found out that digging a hole can protect him from predators. And this beneficial behavior was picked up by the pups that were smart enough. So, already you have selection working for intelligence, but from those, selection will also favor those with better digging abilities, which means that this can actually turn into this. Well, actually they won't because this is a really bad example, but you get the idea. And now to our main topic, epigenetics. So, a quick definition, epigenetics basically means above genetics. But the current and most common definition states that epigenetics is the study of stably heritable phenotypes that occur without alterations in the DNA sequence. For instance, have you ever asked yourself how come your muscle cells, neurons and skin cells all function and look differently, although they all have a complete copy of your entire DNA? Well, it's because of epigenetic processes that commute and express genes on demand, meaning they tweak the phenotype without hard coding the genotype. And as you can see, the phenotypical changes are not only drastic, they also solidify and then pass on to progeny cells. And this is why your stem cells don't stay stemmy. Now, the most important aspect of epigenetics to evolution is its plasticity, meaning that unlike DNA which rarely mutates and its mutations rarely show drastic changes in the phenotype, epigenetic processes are extremely fast with dramatic consequences. They can also be set and reset and basically change continuously throughout your life. So while your genome will accompany you throughout your life in more or less the same way, your epigenome will change time and time again, usually due to environmental pressure, and we'll get to that soon. Though it is worth noting that different epigenetic mechanisms that occur because of different reasons and at different stages in your life are all distinct in persistence and heritability, but that's beside the point. So in any case, besides of its plasticity, another thing that makes epigenetics interesting from an evolutionary standpoint is the fact that its inheritance is not confined to the chromosome, meaning that transgenerational inheritance can occur on many levels. In fact, in most cases, epigenetic markers are not passed directly from one generation to another in the chromosome. So let's see a few examples of transgenerational inheritance of epigenetic marks. Take for instance the Brady Bunch here. Now, you would think that the different coat colors would mean that they have different DNA codes, right? Well, wrong. The different colors were artificially induced by exposing the embryos to different nutrients that cause different epigenetic marks. And better yet, these epigenetic markers somehow leaped on to progenies. 
See? And for the next example, get ready to shake off some old misconceptions and get some good anti-racist ammo. So you know the people that cite African-American crime rates and then colorate them somehow with their coat color? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, skin color? Well, from the DNA deterministic dogma that these people and other use, the picture is really quite simple. Your DNA is the foundation of stuff like criminal tendencies, plus your life experiences can't change your DNA, which makes the environmental role almost immaterial. Now, all the statistics they will tell you show distinct differences. You know, stuff like social economic differences. And thus, logically, the unchanging deterministic DNA is the causal agent. Well, don't get your crosses, gasoline and matches out just yet. Because, you see, we know that socially harsh environments tend to epigenetically mess up your brain. So from an epigenetic standpoint, this whole thing would look more like this which, if not even directly heritable, would at least be inherited through a reinforcing system generation after generation, creating a vicious epigenetic feed-forward loop. And what do I mean by feed-forward loop? Well, for instance, in most mammals, postnatal grooming have profound epigenetic effects on the brain, especially the hippocampus. And the crazy part is that epigenetic markers due to lack of grooming, i.e. neglect, are the same epigenetic marks that will then cause you to neglect your own children. Again, reinforcing itself through the next generation. And we have even more alarming results when stuff happens to pregnant women. Stuff like food deprivation, social defeat, and even more so, abuse by the partner in life. Because epigenetic processes that take place during pregnancy will almost undoubtedly persist for at least three generations. Why three generations? This is why. And again, in certain cases, this might further reinforce itself generation after generation. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Because since epigenetic markers are reversible, scientists are contemplating and devising epigenetic treatments for numerous neurological and psychological disorders such as drug abuse, child abuse, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, cancers and what have you. Now originally I also wanted to talk about women development, gene imprinting and transposons believe me, they're correlated, and how honeybees use epigenetic processes by feeding different larvae different amounts of royal jelly to produce either worker bees or queens. Speaking of queens, I also wanted to explain why one of these twin brothers is gay and the other is straight, also known as epigenetics and generally the implications of epigenetics have on identical twins and many 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 other things but lastly i'll go back to evolution because epigenetic processes have an exceptional ability to facilitate speciation. Now, I won't go into how epigenetics overcome the loss of low-frequency mutations in a population due to genetic drift because I hate equations and especially statistics. But I'll give you instead a more basic approach. So when, for instance, a species invades a new environment, it usually does so in small numbers, causing something that we call a genetic bottleneck or a single founder effect. Now, if you remember, in the last video, I emphasized that selection works on variation rather than mutations. And as you can already understand, genetic bottlenecks cause loss of variation. Now, the cells in your own body are a great example of the power of epigenetics to create a variety of phenotypes out of the same genotype. Also, because epigenetic processes act much faster and are more dramatic than genetic processes, a species can survive long enough solely on the variation caused by epigenetics in order for his genome to adapt in its own rate. 
and this graph explains it a little bit better. Wow, damn, this was intense. So, like always, my beloved YouTube gang, peace, love, harmony, have a good one, people. I love you all. Oh, and next time... As the title says, you are the David Duke of the pro-Israeli side.